Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Claire. I'm a contract librarian here on assignment at NOAA Central Library. This seminar series is offered through the NOAA Central Library Seminar Program, which provides an educational forum for the presentation of ideas, research updates, and news in support of NOAA's mission. Before we start, I have a few technical tips for attendees. Just so you are aware, you are muted and you are not able to unmute. However, if you have a question, you can type it into the question panel and we will get to those during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If you have any audio or visual issues, if you can't hear the speaker or see the slides, please try logging off and logging back on, and that will solve most issues in GoToWebinar. And just as a reminder, this is being recorded. So if you'd like to revisit the seminar or view previous seminars, you can find them on our YouTube channel. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer, who is going to introduce our speakers. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the webinar. I'm Jennifer Zhuang. I'm an economist with the Performance, Risks, and the Social Science Office. Today's webinar is the fourth part of the Economic Input-Output Modeling Seminar Series that PRSSO is organizing. These seminars uh, will provide opportunities for NOAA social scientists, policy analysts, and partners to learn about concepts, uh, available models, best practice, and caveats of this topic for use in the ocean, coastal, and weather-related issues. Uh, there will be another uh, seminar coming up tomorrow on the use of IO models by fisheries uh, economists of NOAA. And if you are interested in the previous seminars, there are recordings uploaded on uh, NOAA Library's YouTube channel. Today's webinar will review the uh, REMI and the AECOM study on the economic impacts of sea level rise and coastal storms and include a live demo of, um, that, that uh, illustrate how REMI model can focus the economic costs uh, that could occur from failing to act to protect businesses from future coastal hazards. The speaker today is uh, Dr. Peter Evangelix. He is Vice President of Economics and Consulting at REMI. After joining REMI in um, uh, 2017, he managed uh, Remy's team of economists contributes to economic modeling software development, serves as principal investigator on numerous pro uh, projects, and um, and he leads uh, Remy's consulting practice from uh, Washington DC office. Um, uh, prior to starting at Remy, uh, Dr. Evangelix taught undergraduate intermediate microeconomics as a lecturer at the University of Chicago. Now, um, Peter, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Jennifer uh, and Claire. Uh, and it's wonderful to, to present today. Uh, so um, as, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, uh, we'd like to talk today about um, you know the issue of coastal resilience and how REMI has has been used and how REMI can be used to analyze this and, and other, many other related issues. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. Uh, so just a brief roadmap. So I'll, I'll just you know provide some uh, introduction uh, to to REMI uh, just very briefly. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, you, know, you know, of course, defining resilience. I don't think I need to sell you too hard on, on, on the importance of resilience, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then we'll get into the AECOM study. Uh, and we'll look at an overview, um, and then we'll look at you know, the, the, the methodology and the results. Um, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, our, our, our analyst, how uh, for a live model demo, which will basically, uh, you know, kind of pop open the hood of the model so you can see um, not exactly what AECOM did, but uh, kind of a, a very analogous kind of simplified um, uh, simulation to show kind of the, the, the essence of what they did and, and how the Remy model works uh, in practice. And then I'll make some concluding remarks and, and certainly happy to take questions. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so REMI has been around for over 40 years, and we've become a nation's leader in dynamic uh, macroeconomic and policy modeling 
at the local, state, national, pol uh, national levels. Um, our, our, you know, our modeling software has been used uh, all over the U.S. to analyze a wide variety of issues, of course, uh, many related to resilience and natural disasters. Uh, and our goal is to improve public policy um, by, you know, allowing for uh, kind of simulation, understanding um, the, the impact of policy in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, in a way, of course, we can't run experiments, but we, you know, we, we feel that our model is very helpful in understanding the potential impacts of a wide variety of policies. You know, today we'll be talking about a number of resilient strategies that can be undertaken at the public and private sector levels. So next slide, please. Uh, and, and just uh, a brief list of some of our, uh, some of our clients, uh, kind of a representative list. Uh, I'll highlight some of them. So the, the 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 NEFRC, the CFRPC, and the SFRPC, kind of the, the three at the top in the middle. Those are three three of our um, Florida Regional Planning Commission uh, clients, uh, and they a number of them, uh, as well as T Tampa Bay Regional Planning Commission and others, have been you know done you know been kind of the vanguard of a lot of these coastal resilience issues given uh, you know, the kind of existential nature of, of these issues to their regions. Uh, we've also worked uh, for many years with the Texas Comptroller, um, who uh, did, did, you know, has done work, oh, there we go, uh, has done work on, uh, for example, Hurricane Harvey when that hit the Houston area several years ago, and understanding the, the, uh, the economic impact of that disaster and recovery situation. Uh, as well as Sandia National Laboratories, obviously uh, in, at the federal level, uh, but they've also done um, a number of projects on, on uh, resilience issues of different types, uh, including uh, looking at um, kind of a, a prospective and then a retrospective study of the impacts of Hurricane Katrina uh, uh, a couple of decades ago. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so we'll, we'll now talk about um, the issue at hand, resilience. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so, you know, simply put, resilience is the, the ability to recover from or adjust quickly to a change in circumstances. So this can, can come uh, in a variety of different realms. Of course, natural disasters is where we'll be focused today, floods, wildfires, earthquakes. And again, you know, we'll be narrowing in you know, today on coastal resilience, but uh, the, the same framework can be applied uh, across the board here. Um, of course, infrastructure failures, power outages, bridge collapses, et cetera, um, that, you know, that we're, you know, cer certainly hope that, you know, the, some of those can be addressed, uh, some, some of the, the risks can be addressed, you know, given the, the new infrastructure bill that was just signed into law. Um, but also resilience to kind of uh, shorter, you know, uh, shorter term and more acute economic shocks as well as longer term economic trends that you see here. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, and of course, like I said, I don't think I have to sell you uh, too hard on why uh, resilience is such an important issue and, and being able to model it. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the experience that I've had in talking with a variety of public agencies, um, you know, at the, you know, at all different levels of government. And really the question of, um, you know, how do, you know, how do we value, uh, you know, first of all, how do we just value, you know, resilient systems? I think we all, everybody recognizes that resilience has a great deal of value. Um, but, you know, it, there's been a challenge um, of, you know, how exactly do we quantify that? Because, of course, uh, we can all recognize the need, um, but there are many needs, uh, you know, in, in a public policy context that are competing for resources. And so how can we quantify the value of resilience investments to make sure that they're proper, that they're properly uh, incorporated into the portfolio of public policy? Um, and that you know that that allows you know policymakers to then not just be reactive but be proactive and establish policies um, you know in advance of potential natural disasters or or other um, you know scenarios where re recovery is needed. Um, establishing a, establishing policy ahead of time based on a kind of rigorous uh, kind of framework of analysis um, that. 
um, that takes it from kind of a subjective understanding of this is important to here are the dollars and cents. Um, we can make a, you know we can make a business case for this uh, for these these types of investments. Um, and of course, there, there's always uh, you know so, somewhat of a not not always a trade off, but there's certainly um, a question always of you know kind of efficiency versus resilience. And certainly, we saw uh, kind of a, a clash of that during uh, during the, the pandemic, where uh, you know a lot of supply chains that were you know very finely crafted to be very efficient were not particularly resilient. And fi finding a way to balance those two priorities is going to be important as we see uh, resilience becoming a bigger and bigger concern given um, the, you know, the higher frequency and higher intensity of extreme weather and, and other uh, events of that nature. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and so, um, you know, the, the title here is Coastal Resilience, and that will be, again, that's the focus of this talk. Uh, but really, you can think of this, uh, this slide as laying out uh, kind of a, I think a useful timeline for understanding um, the, you know, uh, kind of a disaster uh, and, and the analysis uh, of a disaster scenario, um, and kind of understanding the, the having having a framework for for uh, kind of encapsulating that you know th these types of scenarios. So um, I'll say it starts before the disaster happens. So you know we'll be talking about. Uh, some physical uh, resilience investments uh, in, in this particular talk, but also, of course, having a, a plan and, and data and information um, to, you know, to be prepared ahead of time uh, is, is a crucial part of, 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 of the resilience uh, portfolio. And so that's, that's the first piece is, you know, wh where, is, where, is the, where is the economy, where is um, the community before the disaster, and how prepared are they if a disaster should strike? Uh, the next step here, of course, is when disaster strikes, uh, you know, whether that be something that's, you know, a little bit more predictable, um, like, uh, like a hurricane that can be tracked, or whether it's something that's more uh, abrupt and, and less predictable. Um, there's going to be a, a level of damage uh, and disruption that occurs um, in the kind of immediate wake of that disaster. And then, so we have to be able to quantify what are those, what are those impacts? What are those kind of direct on the ground impacts? Buildings being destroyed, property being damaged, business being disrupted. So those are the types of things that happen right away in the midst of a disaster. And then finally, the, the last piece is how does the community how does the, the, the state, the federal government, uh, respond to a disaster? Um, being able to assess what the damage is, not only the, and we'll, we'll talk about this when we're, we're doing the modeling, not only the immediate kind of direct damage, uh, but all of the ripple effects of that damage uh, on, on the economy, on the population. So being, being able to, to make those types of assessments uh, and then making decisions based on that about how to distribute funds that may be made available for rebuilding um, and then using, you know, hopefully being able to use the, the data that comes out of the disaster to better plan for the next one to, to be more uh, resilient against, um, you know, kind of future threats. And I'll say just one, one more thing about being able to quantify you know, the total impact. Uh, you know, if you have, um, you know, if you have businesses that are disrupted um, for a certain amount of time, that not only disrupts, you know, the revenue that they earn, the, their kind of economic footprint, uh, but they, you know, they may also rely on, you know, on suppliers um, that may see uh, demand fall for, for their services or goods. Um, the, you know, to the extent that, you know, you know especially in, in an area that we'll talk about, you know, in a more kind of coastal community that's more service oriented, you know, maybe with, with more kind of hourly workers, um, you, know, you know, losing, losing, losing out on pay, you know, while business is disrupted uh, is also, you know, of course, going to cause hardship, uh, but also uh, economic uh, contraction for other businesses that were relying on labor income being spent in the community. And so being able to, to look at that full picture of 
what what is the total impact of um, you know the total potential impact of the damage from um, some kind of coastal uh, disasters such as a hurricane, tsunami, et cetera, um, and being able to understand kind of the full the full value of resilience in in in, in protecting not only the the direct damage but also the ripple effects of that damage. Let's go to the next slide. So now we'll talk a little bit about the AECOM study specifically. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, so so the, the, the goal of, of, of the study um, is, is twofold. So uh, we, they wanted to understand, uh, you know, what, is, what are the economic effects of uh, kind of future climate conditions? So in, in particular, you know, more severe storms and sea level rise. Um, and, you know, having an understanding on its own um, it, it, it has some value, but of course, it's really meant to inform decisions about how local, state, federal governments can intervene, how businesses can respond. Um, and so really, again, that having that kind of information, um, you know, uh, kind of being able to kind of produce that kind of systematic information about what are the impacts of, of, these, uh, of these types of climate events, um, and a, a lot will allow for planning to take place and, and hopefully mitigation um, you know, of, of the risks that, that are faced by these communities. Um, so you can see here the, the different questions that are being asked. Uh, so you know, what are the impacts uh, of sea level rise and coastal storms you know, on commercial properties? Crucially, how will some of the different response, and, and we'll look at a few different response scenarios, how does how communities and businesses respond uh, affect the the magnitude of the damage? Um, and here we, in here we'll look at that both for uh, the local you know the, the local county in Broward County and Dania Beach as well as for the rest of the state. Of course, the the economy is is all interconnected. So even uh, kind of when we're looking at you know the rest of the state or the rest of the country. Um, there are important linkages between, you know, all of the regions of the country where, um, oh, one second. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> where, uh, you know, impacts radiate out both economically, as I talked about, but also geographically, and being able to capture all of those effects. Uh, so next slide. Uh, great. And so before we uh, before we dive into some of the results, uh, I do want to provide a little bit more context about the specific study region. So this was uh, in uh, Dania Beach, Florida, uh, which is in Broward County in, in South Florida. Uh, and their their economy, as, as you might expect, is you know as as many as are many other similar communities uh, in Florida and in other places as well. Uh, the economy is, is fairly dependent on, on tourism and, and related kind of marine service industries that, of course, are, are, are very vulnerable to coast, kind of types of coastal hazards that, that we're talking about. Um, and it's compounded by the fact that a lot of the businesses in these types of communities are, are smaller businesses uh, that may have less resources and, and are more in need of protection uh, to be able to, to plan for and, and, and adapt to the risks that they face. That in, in a lot of cases, they're, they're not able to make those types of investments on their own uh, and rely on you know, the public sector to, to um, you know, kind of public sector policy to be, uh, you know, partners with them in, in, in assisting them from escaping, you know, too much damage. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, this is a very busy slide. This is just meant to, uh, so I, I won't uh, kind of go into a great amount of detail here, but basically uh, this is a, it kind of the, the, some of the different scenarios that were evaluated. Um, uh, so there are some temporary uh, scenarios and permanent. The temporary scenarios are, you know, discrete storms that occur. Uh, and you'll see here, um, you know, there are two storms that are evaluated that are kind of of the magnitude of a three-year storm, so kind of a fairly, you know, fairly uh, standard, you know, not not every year kind of storm, but but um, 
you know, a, a storm that's, you know, that, that's still fairly common, kind of a three-year storm, um, you know, that, that occurs. Um, and then one kind of 20-year storm, one more severe storm that, that's evaluated. Uh, and then they also evaluate more permanent impacts of sea level rise uh, with the, the level of, of sea level rise increasing over time uh, from one foot of sea level rise in the early part of this timeline uh, up to two feet of sea level rise in the later part of the timeline, which goes from about 2030 to 2070. So for kind of for the purpose of time uh, and for kind of sim simplicity, uh, we're going to talk today about the, the permanent scenarios. We're certainly happy to talk about the temporary scenarios, um, you know, if, if there are further questions um, uh, after the webinar. Next slide. And so the simulation, you know, again, asks the question, how will different response actions or no actions, that, that's one of the options here that provides kind of a baseline how will that affect Broward County? So that's, again, that's the, the county in which Dania Beach is located. And, and how will the rest of the state be affected? So uh, they, you know, of course they use the Remy model. Uh, in terms of the inputs, again, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the response actions, kind of the set of actions that were analyzed. And again, we'll be focusing on more, more kind of permanent uh, actions uh, and those, those really capture several different facets of, uh, of the scenario. So one is, you know, what are the physical impacts and, you know, who are, you know, who, who are the entities that are affected and what are the physical and, and economic impacts? Uh, what are the, the costs and the sources of the funds that go to, <clears throat> excuse me, that go towards the rebuilding process? You know, what are, what are the involved industries? What is the time frame? So all of these are kind of key considerations in thinking about what are the impacts of a disaster and, and then in, in turn being able to mitigate the effects of that disaster. And on the output side, in terms of the results that we'll be looking at, again, we'll be looking at Broward County as well as the rest of the state. Um, and we'll be looking at metrics that in, that, uh, of uh, employment, so kind of job impact, uh, GDP, and, and population. Um, I'll say, you know, Remy has uh, a wide variety of other metrics that are available. Um, these, these are often some of the more, uh, you know, interesting metrics to policymakers. And so that was, that was, uh, that informed kind of the, the narrowing of the focus down to these kind of key results. And uh, next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit about the scenarios, which we call here the, the response actions. Um, so, of course, the first, again, that kind of provides a baseline is no action. So there's no, no investments are, are, are taking place to mitigate sea level rise or storm conditions. Um, uh, it just, once those, uh, once the damage occurs, then, of course, there's, there's rebuilding after, after the fact. Um, the other two scenarios, kind of proactive steps are taken ahead of time. So in the relocate action or the relocate scenario, um, lower line businesses that are at risk of you know, being flooded out uh, will relocate to higher ground within the region or outside of the region kind of as available. Um, and in the fortify action, uh, there's a seawall that's built to prevent low line businesses from um, the flood risk that they, that they would face otherwise. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, and so some of the, again, some of the key elements here um, that, that were looked at are, of course, building damage. So uh, the kind of the physical damage that's faced by, um, you, know, you know, from the, 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 the toll that's taken, you know, from the storm or the flooding. Um, you know, output, output and employment losses, uh, again, that are driven here by, by business disruption. So, you know, if an area is flooded, if power is out, if roads are disrupted, um, there's a lot of business activity that's being disrupted. Um, and, and so we want to be able to quantify that. And gen generally, the way that we think about quantifying that is, you know, how, you know, kind of how long is the disruption and how widespread geographically and across industries. 
um, is, is the disruption taking place. And so that's that's kind of how we quantify um, the both kind of the physical and then the economic direct uh, impacts. Um, there are also uh, often impacts on you know population. Uh, sometimes you know certainly in the short term, you know if if, if kind of temporary relocation needs to take place, um, but also in in a lot of cases, um, you know maybe more permanent population loss if you know especially in certain scenarios where people or businesses are are relocating uh, to uh, to other areas to 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 lower their risk profile. Um, and of course, um, uh, we also have to look at in the recovery uh, part of the timeline, what is the government spending uh, in order to rebuild? And uh, where, you know, kind of where are they generating that revenue? Is it coming from a rainy day fund or are they, you know, temporarily raising taxes or, um, or you know, what are, they, what are they doing in order to um, you know, fund the reconstruction uh, because you know, if, if generally if it's coming from kind of local or state sources, there are there are that, that is a budgetary trade-off where those those entities have generally have to balance their balance their budget. So if they're spending more, they have to raise more revenue or uh, cut elsewhere to to make that work. And so that will have uh, its own uh, economic uh, impacts. So let's go to the next slide. So. I won't spend too much time on this, but I thought since this is kind of a Remy-focused webinar that I would uh, essentially this is, uh, you know, kind of provide uh, a sense of what the model structure is. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how that, uh, you know, kind of what areas are highlighted in, in, in this, this type of analysis. Um, so uh, there, it's broken out into these five kind of tan boxes that represent kind of the different parts of the economy. So uh, output and demand at the top, that top box, that's really a picture of the macro economy. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, you know, in this case, that's the macro economy, uh, say, of Broward County of the state of Florida. Um, so that's things like economic output, uh, GDP, and the components of GDP. Um, that's kind of the, the big picture. In the middle, that labor and capital demand box, that's really businesses making uh, employment or hiring decisions, as well as investment decisions, uh, based on you know the cost of you know kind of you know the cost of labor, you know compensation rates, uh, the productivity of labor, uh, the cost of uh, the cost of capital, and, and some other factors. Um, in the third box, to to the left of that, population and labor supply. Um, that's that's really our kind of demographic piece, and kind of the population de demographics are are very closely tied in with the, the economic outcomes. So we have first of all very detailed demographic cohorts, single year of age all the way up to age 100, um, as well as uh, four uh, race and ethnic categories and, and two genders. So that's kind of 808 demographic kind of cells, um, and we're able to look at you know, population movement, changes in population from births and deaths, as well as from economic migration, economic migration being driven by factors such as, you know, what is the prevailing wage in this region? What is the relative job availability of this region? So again, that's how the, the economy can drive population movement. Uh, of course, uh, in the reverse, population will, of course, affect the economy by uh, you know affecting the level of, of consumption that's occurring in the economy as well as affecting kind of the, the supply in the labor market. Um, and, and, and speaking of the labor market, um, you know, we, we do again have you know labor force participation rates and, and that you know kind of combined with population will, will drive uh, labor force uh, metrics as well. Down at the bottom in that fourth box uh, is really <clears throat> uh, captures a lot of the costs and prices in the economy. So I mentioned compensation rates, so kind of the cost of labor, uh, but also the, you know, the cost of housing that's affected by, affected by population movement and, and economic conditions, uh, as well as the, the, you know, the cost of uh, the, the prices of consumer goods, uh, as well as uh, the cost conditions for businesses. So that, that would be that production cost at the top right of that, of that lower box. Um, and that production cost will have effects on 
kind of the, the competitiveness of a given region. If cost conditions are, are relatively high, then, then a region may have uh, more trouble, uh, you know, more, more trouble competing against other regions, um, you know, for uh, economic activity. And so here, um, you know, here, if, if we're thinking about, you know, how does this fit into the simulation that we're, that we're going to be looking at, you know, one thing that we're looking at is kind of direct, you know, kind of direct hits to economic output from the business disruption of a given, you know, in, in this case, uh, kind of longer term uh, disruption that's coming from, uh, you know, sea level rise. Um, but, but you could think of this as well from, you know, from more discrete events like hurricanes. Um, so if we see it kind of at the very top, we see output. And if we look at the arrows, you know, coming out of output, that's that's going to be driving, you know, for example, that's going to be driving, you know, hits to employment. You know, employment's going to be uh, affecting kind of compensation, uh, labor, you know, kind of labor compensation. That'll be affecting consumption. So you can kind of see kind of the sick, the kind of the, the cyclical nature of the economy being uh, the economy being reflected here. And so shocking, for example, output or, uh, you know, the kind of the stock of, 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 kind of physical capital in the economy uh, having kind of reverberations through, throughout the economy. Let's go to the next slide. So let's take, take a look, uh, look at the results. Um, so these are for the, the three response actions. So we see here. Um, on the left, we see the results for Broward County. On the right, we see the results for um, for the rest of the rest of Florida region. Um, and in blue, we we see the the no kind of the no actions you know scenario. Um, at, and you can think of that as kind of the baseline here. Uh, and then we have two other scenarios where uh, there's relocation. Uh, that's in that's in gray. Uh, and we have the, the kind of the fortification, the building of a seawall scenario, and that's in purple. Um, and so you can see here, um, that, you know, taking no action, um, you know, has the has kind of the worst economic outcome. We see in every year we see losses relative to uh, a no disaster baseline, a kind of a, bit, a business as usual with no disaster. Uh, if we if we take no preemptive action, we're always going to be worse off. And again. You know, here we're worse off kind of in all years uh, because here we're looking at you know what are the impacts of kind of uh, the sea level rise that's having kind of a you know kind of an, an, an annualized kind of effect. If we look at you know the, the relocate scenario um, in most years that's you know in, in every year that's better than doing nothing, um, but it's it's generally not uh, you know still provides at least for the for the local region. You know, it's still in gen generally uh, kind of a negative outcome uh, relative to uh, you know you know re relative to kind of the business as usual no disaster scenario, and that's really because you know kind of a loss of business, a loss of population, um, will will mean that there's kind of just a lower uh, kind of capacity, kind of carrying capacity of the economy if, if certain parts of the the region are being vacated. Uh, and so that's why you see you know, relative, you know, the, the region being relatively worse off. Um, you know, but cer certainly it's, it's better than better than doing nothing. Uh, but you're still, in general, worse off. Uh, aside from you know, you know, the year when you, know, you have kind of a, a discrete event here of, of a storm, where um, you know, kind of as compared to being in the region, um, you're better off not being there in, in the midst of a, a discrete storm. And then, of course, in the fortify scenario, in general, um, you know, is is the best. You know, is, is, you know, you see at the very beginning of that fortify scenario, you see um, you know, kind of positive impacts, and that's real. That really comes from the construction activity around building the seawall, um, and then you see overall, um, you know, very little. You know, there's basically no damage in this scenario being taken, and so you see uh, kind of impact of you know roughly zero so you're kind of eliminating the the downsides of uh the the disaster striking because businesses are protected by the seawall so that that's that scenario um whereas if you look at the rest of florida uh, it provides some interesting you kind know, of counterfactuals 
So we see, you know, even even for the rest of Florida, you know, you know, not taking any action is going to have a negative effect. Um, and of course, that's not that's not through any kind of direct impact on the rest of the Florida economy. That's really, you know, looking at what happens in Broward County and Dania Beach, um, you know, and and the disruptions taking place there. Again, radiate out geographically. There. You know, um, you know, kind of economic and demographic and commuting relationships, you know, across regions. And so, you know, the the Broward County economy, you know, doing worse is also going to negatively affect the rest of Florida. Um, you see that in the fortified scenario, you see, you know, basically no action in the rest of Florida, because uh, you see basically no action in Broward County, and of course, all of the construction activities happening in Broward County. So that initial uptick isn't there. In the rest of the state. Um, and, you know, the, the, the one area where we see a real difference is, you know, with the relocate scenario, we do see some, uh, some kind of positive impacts for the rest of Florida. And that's really, you know, through, you know, folks moving, uh, you know, moving, you know, out of the, you know, not everyone in Dania Beach or Broward County is moving out, but there, there is some relocation that, that occurs. Um, you know, especially when economic conditions uh, deteriorate, especially in the later part of the period. And so, and so the, the, kind of the rest of the state does uh, see some, an uptick. Um, this is a little bit of an artifact uh, of, of, of honing in on one particular community. I think probably, uh, you know, many of these communities, you know, you know, many places in Florida face this situation uh, to varying degrees um, all at once. Um, and so, you know, in order to tell a more holistic story, you probably want to look at you know, kind of the whole portfolio of these different communities. Um, but you can see here, uh, you can get a picture of uh, you know, evaluating different scenarios against each other and seeing what are the impacts of these different scenarios uh, in, in order to be able to kind of really capture, you know, what is the best strategy. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So com coming out of this study, uh, AECOM, uh, you know, made a number of recommendations. Uh, there, there, there's a lot here, and, 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 this, and I believe the slides will be posted later. So I won't get too, in, in, you know, too into detail here. Um, but the, the ways are what you would expect. Um, you know, pr kind of prioritizing investments. Um, you know, uh, expanding access to to data and evaluation techniques. Uh, you know, such as using the Remy model to be able to uh, evaluate, you know, to kind of have a full picture of, of the potential risks and to be able to evaluate different mitigation strategies against each other, um, as well as, you know, working, you know, the business community, uh, working uh, to, together internally, as well as working with the public sector to, to mitigate risk. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so, uh, so now we'll talk a little bit about the REMI model itself, and we'll go into a live demo. So, uh, the, the REMI model that's most appropriate um, for for our, for this for our purposes here in talking about coastal resilience is our E3 plus model, which stands for Energy, Environment, and the Economy. Um, and uh, you can just see here kind of the schematic on on the right hand side of the screen where you know, we can capture in one framework uh, you know, the interrelationships between uh, these, three, you know, these three areas. So of course, you know, in terms of the economy and the environment, you know, what are the long-term economic impacts of you know, environmental regulations or on the flip side of environmental damage like we're talking about today? Uh, you know, you know, between the economy and, and, and the energy markets, you know, what are the economic impacts of changes in energy markets? You know, how do energy choices impact the environment? So, and in all of these areas, we're able to capture um, you know, the answers to a lot of these questions in this framework. Uh, you know, in, in the context of this talk, you know, kind of the, the link between the economy and the environment is the most is most directly related. But of course, um, you know, the, the energy sector is intimately related with how uh, the the environment evolves over time. Next slide. And you know, so, so really to kind of drive this home, you know, E3 Plus allows you to do a variety of things. So you can evaluate 
again, the effectiveness of these different uh, disaster recovery and mitigation plans. Um, you're able to, uh, you know, kind of use that information to design policy um, and, and, and then kind of evaluate different policy options against each other um, and provide kind of easily uh, digestible results to, you know, to key decision makers to uh, operationalize. Uh, the policy options because that, that's always uh, that's always a challenge is being able to effectively communicate uh, what the needs are um, in, in a way that's it's very clear and so uh, we're able to do that as well. Let's go to the next slide. So now I'm going to turn it over to uh, how JE who's been running the slide deck so far. She's going to do uh, a live uh, a live demo uh, and then I'll make just some brief concluding remarks and then we'll have some time for questions. So uh, I'll now mute myself and turn it over to Haji. Um, thank you, Peter. Now I'm going to show you some model simulations variables. So here in, in the screen, which we uh, can see there will be two scenarios, the disaster baseline control and then the resilience scenario. Um, in the resilience, uh, in the disaster scenario, we simulate the negative impacts of sea level rise. So, if a property is subject to the tidal inundation following a rise in sea level, uh, the market value of this property is assumed to be lost in addition to any future ability to generate income on that property. So, in this case, we decrease the capital stock to account for the losses of property value from year 2031 to year 2040. And then we decrease the output for all industries to account for the business impacts of the annual sales losses over the same period. And in the resilience scenario, we will simulate the construction of seawall to protect against the sea level rise, uh, which will increase the sales for the construction sector. And then we, we assume that half of the total project cost will be paid for using property and sales taxes, and the other half will be funded by federal government. And for the resilience measures, uh, we actually increase the capital stock and output to account for avoided losses. And then I will, I will try to um, pull out the, the model so we can take a look at the so we can take a look at the um, the scenario. So now we we are looking at our E three plus uh, product interface and. Um, so you, you may know like this model is actually a national model and it contains all eight region, um, eight BA major regions. And we can actually view all the regions. Um, we can actually view all the regions from the regional profile here, which I can go to a profile and we can see how the United States are divided into different pieces. Um, we can, so here we're doing a, eight BA regions, we can also do county level and also sub-county level. And from the home page, we have the regional control forecast and then the simulation forecast. The regional control forecast serves as our baseline and um, it's our baseline and then we are uh, create a new regional simulation that will be compared to the baseline control to answer all types of what-if questions. So now I will go ahead to create a new regional simulation just to better understand how it will work in the model. So now I'm going to create new regional simulation. And as you notice, there are like different uh, boxes here. Uh, so to the left, we have all types of energy related policy variables. We have energy prices, emission cost, carbon tax, power plant construction, operation and maintenance. So we can go to the construction and we have, we've got all the variables specific to like coal file, solar farm construction, a wind farm, nuclear plant construction, so all types of construction. And in the middle, we have, um, um, we have like different options. So for example, we can go to the full variable list and it will show up all the variables ranging from economics to demographics 
So we've got everything from uh, employment, output, industry sales, sales tax, uh, migrations, and so on. So for example, we can select em employment here, uh, select employment, and then we have different options here. So we, we can just choose the industry employment as the shock, and then we can choose from different industries. Uh, we can choose one industry, so we can also group several industries together. Just click the group industry. And for the region, um, there are eight regions. Um, we can just choose um, the southeast, for example, and the units, um, we can just choose the thousands. Um, and uh, we can add to editor, and for um, here, there are like different cells for you to enter the numbers. So we can just choose, uh, suppose our analysis period can be from 2021 to 2030. So we can choose all these cells and then right click. So there will be a calculator show up. So I just click the calculator and then enter the value. Uh, so now it can be like 10,000 10, job increase for from, from this analysis period. And then I can add to input. So the, uh, the variable will show up in the input list. And after doing this, we can go to the forecast options. So here you can actually run the forecast from year 2020 and uh, um, up to year 2060. And you can run, uh, hit the run button and the forecast will be run uh, very quickly. So actually I have uh, already run a forecast just to show you how the results page looks like. So for example, the uh, here is a ver like a sample results that I'd like to show. So for example, we have different sections. Um, we have economic summary on the left and we also have energy summary. So this section is very unique in history plus. It actually show the energy consumption for all like types of users, including residential, commercial, industrial and transportation. And we can move on to uh, the carbon dioxide emissions. So here the results can also show you um, how the some like environmental impacts. For example, if, if the scenario is investing in electric buses, then you, you will show you like how the uh, carbon emissions will be for that, like for the impacts uh, for that scenario. And uh, to the left, we also have different types of visualizations and also there's economic tables um, and you, show all the- Sorry to interrupt. I, I'm just looking at the time. Uh, maybe we can go to the the resilient scenario that that that, oh. that we ran to, to yeah. kind of tie a bow on this and leave some time for questions. Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So yeah. So now we have a brief understanding of the results page. Then we can go to the uh, like our most important uh, resilience module that I like to show. So. Um, so it's under like to the left there are like different sections so it's on the third one the studies and the, in the new studies there is a natural disaster resilience so i already run it um, so i can just show show the inputs here um as i already mentioned there are two scenarios the first one is disaster baseline control so in this scenario we assume the sea level rise in southeast region so i decreased the capital stock uh, for southeast region by 266 million and uh, um, over a decade from year 2031 and i also decreased output to account for the sales losses the business impacts by about 1.3 billion and over the same analysis period um, to move on to the resilience scenario, so now we um, so now we assume like there will be a sea wall built here to protect against uh, to protect against the uh, disaster. So now we are uh, decreasing the industry sales here from year 2028 to year 2030. And we assume we, we assume like this construction cost will be funded uh, half half of the construction cost will be funded by the federal government and the other half will be paid for uh, by uh, by the sales and property tax raised by the um, state and local governments. Um, and we note here 
um, the construction cost, the funding sources. Um, we, we have to know that um, the funding sources actually we can account for different scenarios for the funding. Um, so here we assume the assumptions on the funding sources are just for the simplicity for this demonstration. And for the resilience measures here, I'm increasing, um, I'm adding back the capital stock, um, the capital losses, and also the output losses because we are uh, we have already built the seawall uh, that will avoid some of the damages. Then we can go to the forecast and uh, hit the run button, and then we'll run run the forecast. The results will show up here. So. Um, it's a light, nice new layout result page, and there are three key uh, indicators, including output, GDP, and employment. So in the output page, we see like um, the total, like there are like four, four blocks in the button. So the red block show the total maximum loss potential, which is 26 billion. And the actual loss um, in resilience scenario, it's like 9 billion. So we are avoiding uh, 17 billion losses here. And, um, um, and this section actually have a built-in um, built calculation on the resilience loss reduction potential, which is about like 64%. And moving on to GDP, we also have a very similar structure here. Um, and we can see like the total maximum loss potential is 15% showing in the red shadow. And the actual loss is like 5 Billion. So we are saving nine billion here, and the resilience reduction, resilience loss reduction potential is 64 percent. And for the employment, we also have um, the total maximum loss potential will be uh, three one one 136,000 jobs. Act actual loss will show in the green shadow, and then we are actually avoid like 87,000 jobs. Yeah, so here is very brief overview of our resilience module. Um, as you can see, it can be really helpful uh, to quantify the avoided, um, the loss that can be avoided because of the resilience measures. Yeah, and with all this, um, I will turn over to Peter uh, to make the conclusion. Thank you, Hachi. I will just uh, wait, wait a beat to get the slides back up. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'll, I'll just say um, as, as we as we uh, increment them uh, that re really that kind of uh, that uh, avoided loss kind of the, that measurement of avoided loss and again that's not just kind of the directly avoided loss but the total uh, the total avoided loss uh, from you know you know from you know both the direct and the kind of indirect and induced all all of the all of the downstream um, you know benefits of avoiding <clears throat> Economic loss from from these types of disasters, um, you know, is captured with, with these types of metrics uh, that, that we see on the screen here. Um, and so I'll, I'll just make a couple of, of brief remarks as we get the slides back up. Um, so you know, with regards to the, the Dania Beach study, you know, specifically, you know, of course, you know, the the, the you know the, the motivating um, and kind of the motivating reason for the study is that you know the, you know that community is particularly vulnerable to coastal storm flooding and sea level rise, you know, and we, and we see in, in the in the no action scenario, you know, almost 37,000 fewer jobs on an annual basis, you know, and a nearly five billion dollar decrease in GDP. Um, you know, whereas if we look at um, you know the for example, if we look at the seawall building scenario. You know, we, we we find actual actually some small kind of positive impacts. Uh, and and by the way, Hadri, if we can get the slides back up and just increment them, thank you. Um, we see here, um, you know, so actually some some increases in employment. You know, where basically a lot of that is carried by <clears throat> some of the initial construction activity, and then the kind of complete or, or near complete mitigation of losses. Uh, and uh, you know, as we talked about, uh, you know, you know, in the relocation scenario, actually, the rest of Florida to, to see some kind of gains, uh, especially in population uh, and some other metrics. Uh, and, and really, the bigger picture here is that you know, resilience investment, you know, not just in Dania Beach, but all over the country, and you know, whether it's coastal resilience or resilience from any other types of, of disasters, um, 
is very is very important to be able to be able to protect you know the, the, those communities and to be able to sustain economic growth as these phenomena get more frequent and more intense and pose greater risks. Uh, sometimes you know just disruptions, but but in, in some cases more existential risks as well. Um, and you know as you know as regions you know face more existential risks, you know, those are more um, you know th those also pose kind of longer term um, you know impacts on kind of this you know kind of the carrying capacity of the economy. Um, and having a tool like E3 Plus to be able to really uh, kind of very straightforwardly quantify kind of the the overall benefits of uh, of resilience investments, um, uh, you know that that that's really the language of policymakers is, is dollars and cents. Uh, if you can put a number on it, you know, then then you can make a kind of a strong argument for proactive policy, um, and, and and hopefully in in the process reduce you know the, the systemic risk to to the economy uh, and create uh, you know opportunities for. You know, for 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 mitigating risk and, and and kind of sustaining growth in the long term. So um, with that, I'll, I'll um, let's go to the final slide. Uh, I'll just land it there, and then oh, uh, apologies. Uh, so uh, just so let's go let's let's go. So just before we go to Q and A, uh, I won't go over any of the specifics here, but this pricing for the E3 Plus model has been provided. We do have a version of the model that has uh, a number of socioeconomic indicators, distributional impacts by you know employment, by race, by gender, by uh, income, by educational attainment, uh, and a variety of other uh, distributional metrics, or what we call SEI or socioeconomic indicators. So we've provided pricing for the E3 Plus model with and without that module attached. And so that that will be provided for 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 everyone's reference. Uh, until let's go to the final slide. Uh, and, and we can just take some, uh, we can take uh, any questions that have arisen. Thanks, Peter. We do have a couple of questions here. I know we're getting close to the time, so if anybody does have to leave right at two, this will be up on YouTube tomorrow if you'd like to revisit this. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, get to the questions here. Um, where did you get your environmental data for forecasting impact? That's a good question. So, um, so for for um, you know AECOM, I believe the study that was done was uh, you know was more looking at uh, some kind of gen kind of general patterns that they were looking at, and kind of you know you know kind of you know looking at some kind of stylized scenarios for what what um, you know what the kind of climate conditions might look like. So you can see kind of you know you know the kind of the timeline of the project you know where we, we had kind of storms you know you know kind of a decade apart and, and looking at some different variations they were kind of nice round numbers so uh, it was uh, you know, I believe kind of looking at kind of general patterns and stylizing them a little bit to be able to look at a variety of different scenarios so for for a given project um, you know there there is often kind of pre modeling that happens like you know what are the direct impacts uh, of of a given policy or of, of a given economic shock, um, and so you know, oftentimes that'll come in the form of you know having an under having an understanding of what's happening on the ground is very important. And then you know, it's 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 my job, it's the job of my team, um, in, in, in assisting users to um, you know translate that understanding of what's happening on the ground and any relevant data, uh, turning that in, in, into model inputs. So you know, in in this case. Um, you know, uh, it was a little bit more stylized, but the, you know, we you know we are able to incorporate you know pretty specific data as well uh, in evaluating. Um, why don't we just yeah, there we go. Um, uh, in in evaluating, uh, you know, in, in kind of in, in doing an analysis, um, you know, we're, we're able to capture you know much more kind of specific data and process that in uh, as well. Uh, so in this in this case, um, you know. Not super detailed, but but we can incorporate much more detailed environmental data uh, for this type of a project. All right, and the next question: um, Does the model have input-output data for regions outside of the U.S.? 
so this so our, our model is uh, is built uh, for, for the US uh, you know we do separately have uh, uh, models uh, for other countries for for just a small handful of other countries like Canada Mexico and some that are overseas but the, the model that, that we showed you and that was used for this analysis uh, is, is, is just for, for the U.S. Okay, and it is two o'clock and that is it for the questions right now. Um, so thank you to our speakers and thank you all for joining us. Um, like I said before, you will be able to find this presentation on YouTube. When the presentation ends, you will see a survey. And if you take the time to fill this out, we do use these surveys to improve marketing our library seminar service and inform future library seminar topics. Um, there is another seminar in the series tomorrow if you'd like to join us for that. Um, thank you all again for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.